Okay, are you ready? I'm ready. Cool. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. We're gonna do it. Hello, hello. Yes. And welcome to Well Behaved Women. This is a very new podcast about misbehaved old ladies. Yeah. From long, long ago. And so recently. And (laughs) And also recently and now. And today and us. (laughs) That's fine. I am your host, Lauren Schill. And I am sitting here with Kyria Phillips. What's up? Hello. What's up? Hello. It is a new week upon us. We also have our uh, best production assistant, Pippin, here. Yes. He's faithfully here. half sleepy watching over us. Yeah, just making sure that we have the facts right and are presenting the information fairly. And offering judgments when he feels they are and warranted. Just deep <laughs> sighing when necessary. So, you know, yeah. we feel very supported by him, and it's great. Yeah, yeah. he's a blessing upon us or whatever. Or whatever, it's fine. Uh, So before we get started on this one, I actually did want to talk to you. So Tony was telling me that she listened to the Harriet episode. And we're recording this before uh, Dora comes out. Right. But we covered really heavy things over the last two topics, like over the last two women. Yes. Um, And... I just would like to say right up top to everyone, we are wildly unqualified to talk about this stuff. But if I stayed away from all of the things that I shouldn't be talking about, we would be missing out on hearing the stories of people that I think it's important to learn about. Yeah. And so we're... I'm, I, get, I, I believe I'm speaking for you as well in when I say, like, every episode we're going to try and uh, do service to the people that we're talking about. Right. And pay respects to the people that need paying respects to. Like, if, you know, we're talking about a horrible person, we're going to... Pay respects to... Fucking make fun of them. Yeah. Like, it's, I, you know, so please don't be offended when we're making fun of murderers or, like... Did I make fun of Harriet Tubman? No. (laughs) I don't, maybe we did. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. But basically Tony was saying that when I, whenever I was quoting something and I used the word Negro, Mm -hmm. um, she was like, you know, it really bothered her. And while I do understand the sensitivity in that, I think it would have been a disservice historically. Like that is a, that is right. part of what was said. That was like th- these are the things that were being talked about. Yeah. Um and I will never like I will try to never treat anyone with disrespect. Right. These were, well that's the thing is that it was not that long ago and posters were put up by white folk men specifically <laughs> yeah. including these words. And if we shy away from that, then we shy away from our own history as white folk. Like we had a hand, not we, per, not me personally, but like as a society. As this demographic. Yeah, as a, and as this demographic and a demographic that heavily voted for the president we have now, like that is our, it's our responsibility to acknowledge that it was not that long ago it really that wasn't. our families or white people's families owned other people's families, mm-hmm. black people's families specifically, like. If we censor the posters, the wanted posters that we're talking about, then I think we're erasing the misdeeds of white folk? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. I think it's it's erasing part of the story if we're choosing to neglect parts of the story that may be unsavory. Like, yeah. that are unsavory to talk about. Yeah. Well, guess what? Fucking everything about slavery was unsavory to talk about. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. it's, it, it's not a fun topic. No. Um, anyway, yeah, so just whenever we talk about these people, we're going to try and do a service to the people that deserve it. Yeah, I guess. and be as honest as possible with the facts that we find. Exactly. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Honesty Hour. For this edition of um, Honesty Hour. Great. Slash know. four warnings of, like, yeah. we're going to cover some hard shit. Yeah. <laughs> and we are not... Not all roses. Historians... I don't think. No. Okay. Great. I was like, I don't want to speak for Lauren. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I don't consider myself a historian, so um, I'm just, you know, I'm learning all kinds of stuff Yeah. on this podcast, and yeah, like, we gotta, we're gonna include all of it. Sorry, that was very stuttery. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Cool. Anyway. Honesty hour. That's us. Cool. And now, to our amazing episode. I'm ready. <sighs> on this year in history. Yes. The Kushan period is founded. Okay. Phaedrus translates Aesop's fables. Oh. Jesus dies. <laughs> there were some crowds he wasn't really popular in. <laughs> yeah, I might have heard a little bit about it. I know a tiny bit about Jesus. <laughs> just a little bit? Yes. Yeah. The myth, the man. The is legend. it just because of the fact that you grew up in the middle of the Bible Belt? Um, no, I mean, I went to church. Oh. My, uh, when I was growing up, before I moved in with my mom. Oh, right. You went to evangelical camps or, or, or Pentecostal, Pentecostal camps. camps. Yeah. Um, Pentecostal church camps and then Pentecostal drama camps. Like drama team was a big deal for some reason in like the Southeastern Pentecostal churches. Um, okay. They would have, um, was it always religious yes. dramas? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. But like drama team also had musical numbers that they learned sign language to. Like it wasn't just drama. It was okay. like youth group. And they would put on, like, a variety show, kind of. Gotcha. But it was all... So they would have comedy scenes that were religious and mm -hmm. songs. And uh, there was one where it was a... They were all dressed in black. The whole room was darkened. And then there was, like, black lights. Mm -hmm. And they had white gloves. And they, like, did a, a Jesus song. Oh, that's cool. With their white gloves. Yeah, it was really cool. That's right? kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> and their gloves made these shapes and, like, told the story while the song played. It was crazy. Like, it was crazy good. And it was very... It was so much talent. Um, it was very deeply religious. Um, that particular camp was held at one of the very fundamental, like, serious Pentecostal churches. Mm -hmm. All of the girls that we... That went to that church of the hosting church mm -hmm. had... Long hair, like hair they didn't cut, skirts to their ankles, and stuff like that. So, yeah, wow. it was um, pretty intense. So, yeah, I'm pretty familiar with the story of Jesus. <laughs> he died. He did. It comes to a gruesome end. <laughs> uh, Agrippa the Elder and her sons were arrested and exiled, and then they died under mysterious circumstances. I have no fucking clue who Agrippa the Elder is. I... We'll do some research. And her sons. Maybe and we do sons. an episode on her. Maybe. Later. Maybe we have a variety show of all the people whose stories are super, super short. Yeah, they're short. Agrippa we'll the that. Elder is this. This is what she did. Yeah. Oh, that would be kind of fun. And there's not a ton of info about it because it's before Jesus died. So it's a <laughs> long time ago. <laughs> but we do a little quick. Mm -hmm. Okay. Basically, okay. It's 30 AD. 30, 30 AD. All right. Now, at this point, Rome had a huge influence around the world. They had invaded Britain and, through a bunch of battles up into the islands, had taken control of the land around yeah. 54 BC. Right. What's called the Roman Empire. Yep. The Roman Empire, yes. A lot of native Britons were not happy about it because of, and because of their numbers, though, the Romans wanted to keep things at, like, peaceful with the oh, Britons. Okay. They invaded it, but then they tried to keep peace they were like we own you but like be chill <laughs> yeah. we don't want to kill all of you so just be part just of our empire seriously <laughs> do it come on bro yeah be, be chill <laughs> all right <laughs> i feel like that was very roman empire they're like listen you guys are powerful but and we will kill you if we have to but we don't want to but we come don't on want to yeah <laughs> Well, the natives were known as Celts, and this title has, like, a little background that needs to go with the word, and I didn't realize this until like I was Celtic? doing all this research. Yeah. Okay. So, cool. uh, there's, like, it's, like, a style, but there's also people, whatever. We're going to talk about them. So, let's start with the Romans, because that's the most obvious one. So, what's in your mental image when you think of a Roman around the time of Christ? Uh, soldiers. Mm hmm And, I don't know like big cities and huge like just you owned so much space mm -hmm. was there a lot of economic inequality i feel like i don't remember i don't know if that's a thing that even came up but like i don't i can't remember if that was a part of the roman life 
Oh, See, I'm this sure. is terrible. I mean, there was like I a whole republic Latin. and there was all sorts of... Yeah. I took Latin for yeah. three years in high school and I'm like, I don't know. I don't remember What's at all. Rome? I've been to Italy <laughs> and Rome and Pompeii. Like, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> the Romans were a group of people who had a great time conquering land. Mm-hmm. When I was researching this, I needed a lot of maps to help me figure out the waxing and the waning of the conquered territories because okay. they overlap a lot and the timeline is really fuzzy, especially around that time. Right. And historians famously love to disagree on things. Right. I don't know if you knew this. Recorded, I don't know if you knew this. Recorded history is iffy at that time anyways, right? Like it's Yes. And every historian has very strong opinions. Yeah. But basically... These guys started down in Italy, and through a lot of really great leadership, they expanded their rule outward across Europe and into Asia and the northern end of Africa. Mm -hmm. The Romans, known for their military style, were methodical about the takeover of surrounding territories. Okay. Basically, they just had a system and got shit done. Yeah, they went to that place, implemented that system. That area now belongs to us. Right. It's like building another Amazon building in Seattle. <laughs> yeah, basically. It's just like Legos. This is what we do. Here's our plans. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now we own you. Mm. Now let's talk about the Celts. Okay. So there is this old ass ethnic group that actually has its roots back to the 6th century BC. Okay. Way back. And it started in what is modern day France, Germany, Slovakia, and Hungary. Mm-hmm. Okay. And a bunch of... The little dudes in between those that didn't exist at the time, all that shit. Yeah. The group eventually reached a giant level of expansion across Europe by 275 BC, and they reached all the way down to what is modern day Turkey. Okay. Wow. Dang. Oh, oh. That was a gobble. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so, uh, started in France. And then, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Big old space. Right. Huge. Uh, the Celts were connected by more by a shared language and culture than they were by blood. And by the mid first century BC, they had all but been wiped out everywhere, but the British Isles. Okay. There had been a huge group of Gauls, which are like a subsection of Celts that battled Caesar in France in the Gallic war. And when the Celts lost, the Gauls, the Celts lost the Romans pushed them back even further. So as the Romans took over Europe and up into Britain, the people they conquered were very quick to pick up on Roman traditions. Okay. And this led to the Romano-Celtic culture that we, that pretty much survives today. Okay. Yeah. After Caesar's victory, there was a period of time, roughly two centuries, where there was a general peace in the land. 200 years. 200 years. Okay. Well, relative peace relative. to the Romans. Sure. To the Sorry. Romans. It was the known as the Pax Romana, or Roman peace. Mostly this was achieved through colonial rule by soldiers and figureheads located in strategic areas. Ah. <laughs> okay. I yeah. understand. The Roman peace. Quote, unquote, quote, unquote, quote, unquote. Police state. <laughs> Great. <laughs> it's a police state is what yes, they exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, but Britain was not the bustling, overcrowded place it is now. It was wild land, and the people that lived there were tough and still operated very largely as a tribal culture. Okay. In 43 AD, the Claudian revolt that had led to Roman... The Claudian revolt led to Roman occupation in Britain, and the Mm -hmm. Celts surrendered pretty much immediately. Okay. Uh, And many leaders were more interested in saving their people than continuing violence and slaughter. So they gave up because they were like, people need to live. As per seems the pattern with the Romans. (sighs) Yeah, pretty much. That's their system. We'll kill you unless you uh, obey. Okay, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll. All right, we for forfeit. Cool. <laughs> we'll just keep killing you. There's more of us, and we will just wipe you out. We'll just kill you. Yeah. Take over anyway. Effective. So. It's an effective form of leadership, I guess. Very effective. In AD 47, the Roman Empire wanted to take away local weapons, and the Celts revolted. On mm. the eastern end of Britain lived a group called the Iceni. This tribe was maybe not quite as fierce or as dangerous as the other tribes in their region. Okay. They were a little more peaceful. When the Romans were about to win again, the royal family from the Iceni tribe reached a compromise with the Roman emperor Claudius. Prasitagus and his tribe would be spared, and he would be allowed to keep some independence from the rest of the Roman rule. But there was a catch. Okay. There's always a catch. 
Yeah. Once again. He had to will his property to his family and the Roman Empire. So when he died, he would ha they would rule it together. So wow. he did this to keep the peace in the region and had to al and to allow a certain level of like independence from Roman rule. So basically, only up until his death, though, right? Well, so or once he dies, their level of independence kind of still remains. The agreement was that, yeah, if you allow us to still operate peacefully in our own land, in our ways, and stop killing us. When I die, you can share ownership of this land okay. with my daughters. Like, you're already saying that it's Roman land anyway, right. so we'll just... A piece of paper isn't going to make a fucking difference to this guy. Okay. But as long as his people can still live peacefully. Yeah. Right? All right. So this guy, Tacitus, wrote, The Icenian king, Prasitagus, celebrated for his long prosperity, had named his, the emperor his heir, together with his two daughters, an act of deference which he thought would place his kingdom and household beyond the risk of injury. The result was contrary, so much so that his kingdom was pillaged by centurions, his household by slaves, as though they had been all prizes of war. End quote. So the Romans, as usual, took advantage of their conquered. Right. Even so, the Iceni existed in relative peace under the spiritual leadership of Prasitagus and his wife Boudicca. So the Romans came, destroyed his shit, and they, he was still like, it's fine. Basically. <laughs> they, they destroyed his shit, and then he was like, well, as long as you let my people, like, live, live and th leave them alone, like, okay, fine, whatever. Like, you can have the shit, just leave my people alone. And so they basically Jeez. were like, all right, fine. And so then they left him alone for a bunch of years. Sure. All right. So then Prasitagus died in AD 60. Mm -hmm. He had willed his kingdom to be jointly ruled by his daughters and the Roman Empire. Since his daughters were still young, they would be guided by the queen slash priestess of their tribe until they came of age. Okay. Their mother, Boudicca. God. All right. I don't know if anyone else has heard this, like this tale before, but God, she's, ugh, you're going to love it. <laughs> All right. She was, quote, very tall. Her eyes seemed to stab you. Her voice was harsh and loud. Her thick reddish brown hair flung down below her waist. She always wore a great golden torque around her neck and a flowing tartan cloak fastened with a brooch. End quote. I love her. I love her instantly. She I had a big she's... gold necklace. <laughs> I hope she's not a terrible person because I love her instantly. Love her instantly. <laughs> Over the years, Prasitagus had come into quite a bit of debt to the Romans. And when he died, the soldiers called in all of them at the same time. Of course. Which Boudicca was not prepared for. No. Prasitagus' agreement, uh, Prasitagus' agreement with the, of peace had been with the Emperor Claudius, but now Nero was in charge, and he did not honor their agreement. Oh. They invited the tribe, stripped Boudicca, whipped her, and flogged her. Her daughters were taken by the soldiers and gang raped. Oh, no. Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's awful. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like Fuck it. So <laughs> this was a shocking event to the Iceni. Because they're very I'll say peaceful. so. Right. Word spread quickly to the surrounding tribes of Celts. As it turns out, the Romans had been abusing their rule everywhere. Ooh. They were incited to act. It was a cause for the Iceni, the Trinovantes, and likely the Catavolani and the Coritani to put aside all... Of, these are all the tribes in the yeah. area... They basically put aside their long-standing differences and were like, we're going to avenge this injustice. Yeah. And it pissed Boudicca off something worse. She was so upset about the fact that her daughters had been raped. Oh, yes. Okay. And I thought you meant about the No, no, no. She was coming together. fucking mad. And I, she I was thought you meant pissed. about the groups coming together, and I was like, what? Why? No, no, no. no okay, she, yes. Yeah. She was happy that her tribes were going to that the tribes are going to come together she's because happy this was fucking bullshit because she was pissed yes yeah. she's happy that they came together because this was some goddamn bullshit some goddamn bullshit when it came to deciding who would lead the revolt there was really no question of who held the title Boudicca was an established figure in the public eye i love it she held the scars of unjustified abuse what should have been a period of grief over the loss of her husband had become the sparks that lit the flame of revolution amazing amazing 
Tacitus records that she addressed her army with these words, quote, it is not as a woman descended from noble ancestry, but as one of the people that I am avenging my lost freedom, my scourged body, the outraged chastity of my daughters, end quote, and concluded, quote, this is a woman's resolve, as for men, they may live and be slaves, end quote. <laughs> yes, bitch. Okay. <laughs> Do it, Boudicca. Let's go. I'm ready. Drawing inspirations from Arminius, who was a prince in Germany who had driven the Romans out in AD 9, mm-hmm. and from their own ancestors, having driven out Julius Caesar from Britain, they set out for Camulodunum, uh, or Camulodunum. I think I'm, I think that's the writer pronunciation. <laughs> Camulodunum. <laughs> the writer pronunciation. <laughs> the more correct. It's not actually a place anymore. So yeah. it, uh, so it's whatever. hard to, sure. Get it. Camulodunum. Formerly the capital of the Trenavantes, which is one of the tribes, mm-hmm. the Romans had captured it in 43, in AD 43, and they'd set it up as their capital. Okay, like in the area. Okay. Yeah, it was like the head honcho Roman gathering place. For that region. For that region. The Romans were infamous for their strict organization. In the span of a night, a Roman army could pop up in your backyard, fully formed and tossing out Frisbee b- by breakfast. Wow. Yeah. They would just show up in the middle of the night and buy every, like, tense, like, sh- fucking drills, this exercise areas. This reminds me a lot of, and I don't know if I'm wrong or right, so you can cut this out if it doesn't work out, but this reminds me a lot of, I think, um, like, the Nazi party took a lot of inspiration from the way the Romans had everything set up, like, very um, bureaucratic. There was always, like, a ton of, like, steps and shit that needed to happen, mm-hmm. but once it all happened, it was just, like, <laughs> efficiency. I think I will research to see, like, to see if that's yeah, if that holds weight. But yeah, for sure, we will leave it if in if so, because if so, that's fucking awesome. Like, I and I love that kind of just strategically logistics. Lauren, every once in a while, she comes out and she loves that kind of brain where everything is set up so that when the dominoes fall, everything is fine. Yeah, because when you're planning up to events, that's basically it. You just have to set all of these things up. Well, yeah, I mean, that, it's yes, wonderful. that method no, works like, wonderfully just, for good it, things. But it's well, just, well, no, no, I, <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. Like you having a like, like, oh, mm-hmm. that's, I love that. That's interesting is, I don't think bad because no. it's definitely like a positive. It's a very thing organized way to think. It's like yeah. very admirable. It was just used. Strategically. <laughs> Terribly. <laughs> it was just used for horrible purposes. Anyway. They also slowly diminished as they traveled. <laughs> Wait, so they were going to the camp, camp and camp. So, yeah. In the meantime, the so as the Romans were conquering Britain, mm-hmm. they were they would set up a camp and then some of them would stay and most of them would leave. And then they would set up a camp and some of them would stay and most of them would leave. So there it's like this slowly diminishing army as it moved around. And so okay. there were Romans that were in Camelodunum mm-hmm. at that time, but most of the people by that, most of the soldiers by that time had gone on to their other conquering things. Right. Okay. So they just left behind some people to keep the peace. The pe- keep the, the peace. Keep yes. the police state active. Basically. Within the city. Yes. And then the, mo- the majority of them would move on. Right. Okay. So at that moment, the captain of the Roman army, Suetonius, was settled in a place called Londinium that was miles away. Okay. So Boudicca's army was made up of angry angry tribesmen ready to avenge injustice with a blood debt. Their tactics were created in rage with no other goal than that of total annihilation. They descended on Camelodunum all at once, taking the Romans quite by surprise. Yeah. Yeah. I'd fucking say so. This attack must have been particularly hard on the Trinovantes, as this had been their home, and now they were destroying it. Someone was sent to Catus, Catus De, De Cien, Decianus, ugh, Catus Decianus. The pre, it was, he was the pre, procurator of the area. He was only able to send a small form of assistance in the form of 200 men. The fact that he had been able to send men probably means he didn't live in, that he had to send them, probably means that he didn't live in Camelodunum at the time, so they probably fled to Londinium looking for Catus. Oh, okay. Like these, Whoever was looking for the guy, they probably went all the way to Londinium to do it. Yeah. But it was no use, because the city fell quickly, and the last remaining Romans were held under siege in a temple for two days before it was destroyed. 
According to wow. archaeologists, the army then methodically destroyed the town. Specifically said methodically. Mm-hmm. Few survivors escaped. From the point of a Roman writing about this later, quote, the victorious enemy met Petilius Surrealis, a commander of the 9th Legion, as he was coming to the rescue, routed his troops, and destroyed all his infantry. Surrealis escaped with some cavalry into the camp and was saved by its fortifications, end quote. Wow. They just fucked shit up. Fucked shit up. They yeah. killed everyone they could and burned the entire fucking city down. Wow. This was an embarrassing defeat to Catus Decianus, mm -hmm. and he fled to Gaul. So he went away from Britain altogether. He went all the way to France. Yeah. And was never heard of again in this story. Okay. After Camelodunum had been adequately sacked, Boudicca set her sights and her army towards Londinium. Yep. Let's go. Let's go. The general of the Roman army of, at well, the time. Well, and she doesn't have to shrink her army as she leaves, because she's not trying to control that city. No, she, she burned that to city fucking, to the ground. She burned it to the ground. So everybody goes with her. No survivors. Everyone fucking comes with. And <laughs> everyone, like the family is coming with too. This is like a cult. This is like a community affair. Yeah, everybody's at this point. going. Yeah. Everyone. All the fighting people and all the non fighters that are there to just watch shit go down. Yeah. All right. Yes. She takes everyone. So her daughters are with her? Her daughters are with her. Her daughters are with her the whole yeah. time. Yeah. The general of the Roman army at the time, Suetonius, heard of the defeat and covered a lot more land in a lot less time than it took for Boudicca's army to show up. Mm. So first, Suetonius had a scant army, making it easy for his fully trained soldiers to cover a lot of ground, as the army wasn't that large. Right. Second, Boudicca had gained a following. More than just tribesmen had flocked to her banner, and now women, children, and wagons were just tagging along. They had gained an audience... Suetonius arrived just in time for Boudicca to begin destroying the city, and at this point, Suetonius remembered that history is based on outcomes of wars, not battles. So what left. up, British History Podcast? Sorry, yeah. that was where I got that line, and it, oh. it's, it's so good. Yeah. So he left. He, yeah, he, he just... He was like, well, I'm not going to risk it for this battle that's already... She's already destroying the city, so we're, we're gonna... about to get there. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, I was so excited. <laughs> I'm jumping ahead. All right. No, we're so good. It's fine. Basically, in an effort to set himself and his army up for success, he sacrificed Londinium, leaving it to be destroyed by the ever-growing army of Celts. Suetonius assisted as many as he could in escaping the city, but those who did not escape were destined to, to, for torture before their deaths. Woof. Woof. Yeah. Tortured. Are these right citizens? Citizens. Everyone who lives there. The whole fucking But it's city. Romans. All the Romans yep. that live there? Okay. There well, no it's Romans and Celts also, left. like, basically, like, the, mm -hmm. the tribes had left that city. Right. So just, it was people who took over after the tribes got yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. The next town on the path of destruction was Verulamium. They weren't interested in taking prisoners or hostages. They were interested in destroying every home, every item, every person in their path. Wow. Archaeologists found a solid layer of red in the earth throughout the town, which suggests that the entire place was on fire at some point. Wow. Dio. A true scorched earth policy. A true scorched earth policy. <laughs> like, burn that motherfucker to the ground. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. Mm. Dio gives an account that says that the noblest women were impaled on spikes and had their breasts cut off and sewn into their mouths to the accompaniment of sacrifices banquets and wanton behavior jesus christ in sacred places yeah yeah in these three settlements destroyed between 70 and 80 thousand people are said to have been killed holy shit that's efficient is her army big enough she has like four tribes yeah with her but even so i mean it's totally by surprise also it's totally by surprise they're just showing up like barely getting any word yeah. And they don't care. They're just going to destroy whatever they see, whenever they see it. Yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous. When Boudicca's army continued their assault into Verulamium, which is, I think, St. Albans now, mm -hmm. Suetonius regrouped his re forces. He sent out a call to other legions of soldiers to come assist, and even after many refused him, he amassed an army of about 10,000 men. Why would people refuse him? Is he... 
are the Romans scared of her by this point, or? That, but also, like, maybe they're dealing with shit in their own area, and so they're just like, okay, we don't have time for this. Like, we can't risk, we can't afford our men going here right now. Yeah. Or it was just too late. Like, he didn't have enough time to oh, okay. send everyone there. I don't I don't know what the reasons are. But basically, he gets about 10,000 people. Yeah. He decided that the best place to take a stand would be along the Roman road called Watling Street. Even if he had lined each of his, these men up side by side, he would not have been able to match the size of the front line of Boudicca's army. From the Roman accounts, by this time, her numbers were almost 300,000. Oh my gosh. But even if that number is cut in half, the Romans were still outnumbered over 100 to 1. Yeah. This was the first time Boudicca had met with any measurable source of resistance to the absolutely devastating army she had led in a path of destruction. Mm -hmm. uh, not only did she command a huge army, but large groups of families, as we said before, and locals had turned out, and the locals as they're moving through the cities. Yeah. They're like, what's going on? And then they follow them to see what's going to happen. Next. Yeah. So the people that like weren't involved in the burning down of the cities, but maybe had like little plantations or something around yeah. there that weren't involved in any of it, just joined her. They just stood started behind moving her. along with yep. her. Wow. Yeah. Tacitus records her giving an rousing speech from the her chariot. She presents. I, I think <clears throat> some of this, this speech, and then the speech before. Mm -hmm. They sound very similar, and I want to say that she gives him twice. Oh, okay. But I will just say I am not 100% sure on that. Okay. But there's just, it's brought up, the same type of speech is brought up to different points. Oh, okay. As she is going through this shit. She presents herself not as an aristocrat avenging her lost wealth, but as an ordinary person Again, yeah, it sounds the same. Uh, avenging her lost freedom, her battered body, and the abused chastity of her daughters. Mm -hmm. She said that their cause was just and the deities were on their side. The one legion that had dared to face them had been destroyed. She, a woman, was resolved to win or die. If the men wanted to live in slavery, that was their choice. Wow. Then they ran for the Romans. Quote, at first the legionaries stood motionless, keeping to the defile as a natural protection. Then, when the closer advance of the enemy had enabled them to exhaust their missiles with a certitude of aim, they dashed forward in a wedge-like formation. The auxiliaries charged in the same style, and the cavalry with lances extended broke away through any parties of resolute men whom they encountered. The remainder took to flight, although escape was difficult as the cordon of wagons had blocked the outlets. The took wagons that are behind. Oh, the, not the wagons actual, that have shown up for yeah. the battle, like to see what's going on, they yeah. had blocked all of the escape routes. Wow. The troops gave no quarter even to the women. The baggage animals themselves had been speared and added to the pile of bodies. The glory won in the course of a day was remarkable and equal to that of our older victories. For by some accounts, little less than eighty thousand Britons fell at a cost of some four hundred Romans killed and not and a not much greater number of wounded. Boudica ended her days by poison. While Poenius Posthumus, a cramp, camp prefect of Second Legion, informed of the exploits of the men of the 14th and 20th, and conscious that he had cheated his own corpse, core of a share in the honors, and had violated the rules of service by ignoring the orders of his commander, ran his sword through his body. Wait, I'm so sorry. That was a lot. Yeah. What <clears throat> happened? Okay. I needed to get through the quote, and yeah. now we can fucking talk about it. Yeah. So basically... Boudicca's army is running at the Romans. They're like, ah! And the Romans yeah. stand still. Yeah. And Boudicca's army is like, ah! And the Romans stand still. Stand still. And Boudicca's army is like, ah! And then the Romans go, all right, let's go. And so then they wedge form and they but just fucking bust through and then they destroy everything. And so then there's like this break in the battle. Yeah. And when they realize that they're systematically getting killed by these people, the uh, Boudicca's army starts to try and escape. They want to get out. They're like, okay, God, like, what have we gotten into? Let's retreat. And so they start to retreat, but there's no way for them to retreat. The wagons are all behind them and the stuff. The wagons are all behind them. Yeah. They have an audience yeah. to this massacre. Yeah. And the Romans give no fucking quarter. So not only Doesn't do all matter. of the people that are in the battle die, but all of the people that came to watch the battle are yeah. killed too. Wow. Everyone dies. And, okay, so the Roman army is smaller. 
smaller. Than, by a lot. By a lot. Than Boudicca's. And definitively wins this battle. Also, let's just say, up, like, not up top. This is not up top. <laughs> just right here in the middle. Let's <laughs> right say it right in here in the middle. middle. But also just in a generality, like, Romans are known to exaggerate their numbers to make themselves look better. Like, this right. is very... His- I'm not a historian, but this is a an agreed upon thing. Like, right, Romans have been known to boast on themselves once or twice. Yeah, but even if it was cut in half, even if it was cut in half, still over a hundred to one. A lot of people, and these guys were just so much better trained and well prepared, yeah. and they like chosen this specific street because it offered whatever, whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And then Boudica died by poisoning. Boudica and her daughters. They poisoned themselves. Uh huh. They were like, no, we're not gonna fucking get taken. Yeah. We're it's not, not doing that again. Basically, yeah. Right. Well, it is debated in a couple of different sources how Boudicca's end came about. According to this last source, she ended her days by poison, mm-hmm. like we just said, her daughters going out with her instead of them being captured by the Romans. But two decades before this account, another record states that Boudicca fell ill, and when she died, she was given a big funeral. But the last battle was the difference between. She was, I, I think it was more poison. Mm-hmm. I think that was the more likely thing. She yeah. was just like, no, fuck that. Yeah. Maybe there's like a memorial later. Yeah. But of who, who did the memorial? Everybody died. Everybody died. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. Oh my God. Everyone yeah. fucking died. <sighs> anyway, that last battle was actually the difference between Britain that we know today and what could have been Britain without the any more interference from the Romans. If they had won that battle, it would have driven the Romans out and we would be looking at a very different, like, yeah, Yeah. Yeah. it would be like a more Celtic, basically. Huh. Interesting. Yes. Uh, Suetonius took Boudicca's revolt personally. So his army paid back the lives lost and then some. It is said that 70 to 80,000 lives were lost as a result of Boudicca's town sackings, but this looks like child's play after Suetonius was done. In fact, he was so particularly cruel in his repayment of the revolt that he was investigated for his behavior and pulled away from Britain altogether. Wow. Nero was a tad embarrassed. He was the new emperor. Right. And he was uh, really embarrassed about the fact that Suetonius had been so horrible to these people, so he spent sent like this more amenable governor to Britain, mm-hmm. who had a lot of work to, to a lot do, of, yeah, to to smooth things over. It was a little bit um so community outreach. You'd say community outreach was yeah. a big part of his having, campaign. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He financed a drive-in theater. <laughs> the apology tour. <laughs> yes. Nero's apology tour with a new governor. Okay. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Suetonius. Fuck Suetonius. Yeah. So that's Boudicca. It wow. was a quick one. Yeah, that is a quick one, but still. Very. Yeah. I There's not care. a whole lot of information on her, but basically we can't do this without talking about her <laughs> yeah no it's so cool and you know there's more information about her than a grip of the elder maybe maybe so we'll see <laughs> i'm making a lot of assumptions about poor agrippa here so i'm making more judgments about the fact that her name is agrippa that was a popular name back in the time it comes up on yeah back in the day let me see I'm i also make big judgments on people named mildred that's just a very hard name to say. You're an asshole. So <laughs> There are certain kinds of names where I have, like, every person that I've ever met that is that person has been, like, a fucking jerk. She was born in 14 BC, the doctor of Marcus, something Agrippa, a close supporter of Rome's first emperor, Augustus, and Augustus's daughter, Julia the Elder. At the time of her birth, she had adoptive brothers... How much information is there? Oh, a big old Wikipedia article. Hell yeah. Okay. Well, I guess that's right, coming. I'll stop then. reading about her. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I love it. Great. Let's so go. this is gonna come out in 2020. Oh my god, that's crazy! Happy 2020, hoes. Um. <laughs> I am so excited for the Roaring Twenties to come back. 
Yeah. I am going to get flapper dresses. You're going full into it. I am fully going into it. Sorry yeah. about all that. That's fine. <clears throat> um, yeah, no, I, I love it. Like, I do not look good in short hair, but I will do that cute thing where I put a headband right around my forehead yeah. and, like, curl everything and pin it back. Yeah. Ugh. Let's bring back the style of the 20s because it's fucking adorable. Yeah. It is cute. Also it's glitz fun. and glam. So much effort. <laughs> uh. Okay, guys. Uh, kill it in 2020. I turn 30 between this episode and next one, so. Woo! We're going to celebrate in style. Yes. See you when I'm 30. What is your What is your uh, party theme? Desserty 30. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm so excited. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We're going to go. I just wanted you to say that. <laughs> I'm so excited. Yeah. Well, dirty, flirty, and nerdy were the other ones that are popular. And I was like, no, none of those sound fun. I want to do desserty 30 and I just order sweets everywhere I go. And that you know how like I'm going to really... start it? Hmm. I work, I think, the 9th or whatever. My birthday's the 11th. I work either the 8th or the 9th. And mm-hmm. then I'm off for like a stretch of days. So that day, when I get off work, I'm going to go to QFC and buy a mini cheesecake. <laughs> no. Um, there is this there's this amazing bakery, Bakery Nouveau, and they have slices of cheesecake. I know, but I don't want to go to Junction at, like, 7 o'clock at night when I get off work. It will be worth it. That's the thing. Is like, their cheesecake is so worth it. Well, that's the thing, is that I can go to Bakery Nouveau on one of the days that I'm off work. I want to go to QFC <laughs> at 7.30 p.m. <laughs> on a Wednesday <laughs> and get some fucking cooler cheesecake. <laughs> And be like starting dessert 30 oh my god right now <laughs> and it'll run probably from january 8th through the 15th usually that's yep. how that, how long my <laughs> birthday usually spans about a week birthday week yeah i like it yeah so i'm gonna have about a week-long celebration probably of things that i do cool i don't know it's really just until i can stop saying like this is my birthday lunch or whatever <laughs> until you can stop you you can't use that as an excuse anymore right it's really up until like that stops making sense right I like it. All right, cool. Uh, Have a good one, you guys. Happy New Year, guys. Happy Jan. Bye.